Welcome to the Style Free Podcast, where a father and son detail and digress on a wide variety of topics within music, art, family, and culture. Your hosts are Professor Stephen J. Tyson, Sr. and Jr., also known as Dad and Papa. In today's episode, we discuss legendary album covers from the 1970s through today from Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind and Fire, Kendrick Lamar, Logic, and others, plus the artists who created them, including Mark Ryden, Maddie Clarwine, Shusei Nagaoka, Sam Spratt, and more. Welcome back to another episode of Style Free Podcast. It's great to be back here again with you, Dad. It's always good being with you, Papo. Our conversation today is going to be focused around really cool album covers and album artwork. Uh, We're going to be talking about uh, albums like Michael Jackson's Dangerous, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly, Earth, Wind & Fire's Rays and All in All, Miles Davis' Bitches Brew. Some really cool albums where the music is phenomenal and, you know, we all know and love and appreciate the music, uh, but the album artwork is really incredible. Yeah, one of the important things uh, also to mention from my point of view uh, is the fact that growing up in an era of the 33 and the third speed record, Mm -hmm. you know, where you had actual albums that you open up, gatefold albums, or you flip it on the back and you look at examples of some of the ideas behind some of the artwork that might be referenced. Mm -hmm. I I think that that's... um, I don't know how common that is today, you know, and I admittedly, I'm not as up to date with uh, how people are getting information out to the public, you know, through their music packaging. I think that we're, we're in a different era where much of what you see is really through the music itself and perhaps commentary on social media about the particular music. But in the era in which I grew up and of which you experience some of that, you were able to actually connect the visual with the content of the music itself. And so I thought it might be an interesting opportunity for our listeners and just for you and me just to have this conversation, just to explore, you know, kind of tease that out and perhaps even bring attention to some of those albums or the album covers that, um, Uh, were impactful to both you and I. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that's one thing that, you know, I've definitely noticed, especially with this era of streaming music, there's really cool album artwork that is definitely done and created. And I think that's one of the reasons also why a lot of physical copies of albums, especially like how there's a resurgence in vinyl right now, allows for a greater appreciation for the artwork itself. Um, because if it's just a small little square on whatever streaming platform you were, you know, listening to the music through, mm-hmm. you might not appreciate it as much as actually holding a 12 inch version of the image and actually getting to interact with the artwork itself, opening it up, as you're saying, and seeing other artwork that's inside of it, even seeing mm-hmm. the lyrics and, and getting a deeper appreciation for the music through reading the lyrics as the music is playing. Uh, something that I used to love doing as a kid. Yeah, yeah. And and also the fact that in reading those notes, now we're kind of going into the line of note aspect of it or the <laughs> credits. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I think it's important, you know, that that people recognize that the artist's name, like a Michael Jackson, might be, you know, on the marquee or it might be on the label. But who are the people that help Michael get out there with that particular music Mm -hmm. who were the arrangers who were the the producers or who were the instrumentalists Uh, all of the 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 publicists the the, i mean there's a whole community of people behind these individual artists so for example when i would be listening to the music of earth wind and fire let's Mm -hmm. say all in all it became later important for me to find out well who was this gentleman tom tom 84 who was an arranger you know, on that album. And, you know, to discover he was Thomas Washington out of Chicago, that he had also connections with chess records, the Shy Lights, and that um, also association with uh, Charles Stepney, who had previously worked with uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, to learn that Bruce Swedean also worked with Thomas Washington, Tom Tom, and the Shy Lights on, on some of their recordings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Bruce Swedean, or Svensk, as Quincy would, would call him, uh, would later go on to work with Quincy and Michael Jackson, you know, and Thriller and, 
and other uh, production uh, work yeah. uh, as an engineer. You know, so so the connection between all of these artists, uh, the context out of which they came, what they've brought from their respective areas to the final result in a Michael Jackson, I think is is important to know. You know, that it's just not one person, but it's a community. You know, they say it takes a village. I mean, it's that kind of sensibility, that sense of community, which I think is important to acknowledge. It's just not one person. It's just not one person alone. It is a community of people behind that person, you know, that brings it forward. So that person is the vehicle through which that expresses a particular point of view uh, that, that in many ways can be reflective of the very community that they are speaking to. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah most definitely. So uh, that actually makes me think of... Uh, one album cover and album artwork thinking about community and, and uh, a collective in, in creating a, a work of art uh, is the album artwork for Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was actually a combination of work done by a photographer uh, named Denis Rouvre from France who took a photo of a bunch of black men and you know black boys and a variety of different photos in different contexts and settings, but mainly all holding money, celebrating, holding champagne. I think the, the final version of the one on the album also has some women in it as well. They're all like you know, on the White House lawn. That concept was also then brought to life by a, uh, I guess like a production designer, artistic designer known as Vlad Sepetov or Sepetov. Uh, I don't know, really know how to pronounce his name, unfortunately, sorry. But both of them together as a duo helped to create the artwork for To Pimp a Butterfly, mm-hmm. um, which is definitely mm-hmm. very provocative. You know, people think of Kendrick Lamar justifiably as a creative genius, you know, through his lyrics and his music, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning artist, Grammy Award winning artist, etc. And at the same time, the artwork itself, I think, is equitably as masterful um, as far as being provocative, creating a conversation around what people see and, and like what's mm-hmm. the image and the and the narrative that you get of an image of black people celebrating on the White House lawn, holding stacks of money and bottles of champagne, you know, all while sitting on a deceased white judge who historically, you know, these white male judges have put in laws that have continually oppressed and repressed black people. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this artwork, I just think is really powerful. Whenever I first bought the album, I bought multiple copies of the album whenever it came out, because I was even, I bought a copy for you at one point. I bought a copy for friends. Mm -hmm. I was like, y'all got to hear this album. It's it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But the artwork itself, I think, often goes underappreciated because there can be this perception or possibly misperception. That's the thing about art, too. You know, it's all subjective to whatever the viewer's interpretation of it is. Mm-hmm. You know, one person mm-hmm. could see it and see one thing. One person could see it and see another thing. But, you know, it being a rap album or a hip hop album, you know, the fact that there's black men shirtless holding money and champagne doesn't mm-hmm. seem to be too far from the standard standard, you know, trope of black men in hip hop, you know, with, Mm -hmm. you know, women in the picture, but they're also covered by, you know, hands and bottles. You can't really even tell that there are even women in the picture, Mm -hmm. um, except for the one that's just over Kendrick's shoulder a little bit. She's the only woman that actually has her face visibly in it. It's not covered by a bottle or a money or the West Coast that one of the guys is throwing up. Yeah, so I'm just curious. I mean, first of all, shout out to Denis and Vlad because it's a really excellent portrait and picture. And then it was also another image that Denis had taken that was also used, I think, within the album artwork itself um, of Kendrick, also with, you know, money and champagne bottles, but he's by himself in a more subdued state. But nonetheless, I, I just think that it's such a you know, provocative image. And I'm curious, you know, to get your perspective on it as well, too, combining photography as well as artistic direction and creativity um, Mm -hmm. and the kind of narrative that, you know, an image like this can project. Yeah, I absolutely agree that it is a provocative uh, album cover. And I can see on one hand, you know, the point of view that this is something that's celebratory. It represents a, a certain kind of success you know, in terms of financial success, uh, overcoming perhaps adverse circumstances. The celebration, of course, with the champagne, I mean, that's something that you find at many different types of uh, celebratory functions. On the other hand, uh, the fact that these are 
gentlemen, they're not wearing suits and ties, but they are bare chested. They have different varying expressions on their faces. Some are happy, some with scowls. Uh, and um, there's not just the women who were partially hidden, which were obviously photoshopped in, but there's also some children in this as well. And the children, one of the children at least has his hands raised as though also in celebration. So it kind of signals the idea that um, there's a message of strength, of power, of overcoming circumstances in front of the White House, which is in the backdrop, mm -hmm. uh, which makes a statement. And then with the, with the judge lying on the ground with his gavel, with X's in his eyes, you know, shows that perhaps he suggests a kind of injustice that has been uh, in certainly all too familiar story about how justice has been in unjustly meted out to generations of Black folk and Black males, of course, being one of the primary targets. But I think it also can play into a certain trope where the Black male is sort of out of control, drinking, uh, money grabbing, that sort of thing. I think that, that that's a, another perception that could that this could sort of play into that particular stereotype as well. And so I think it is a mixed bag. It is a controversial and provocative visual statement, no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, tying it into then the music itself is all about making you think and thinking about different perspectives, reflecting on yourself and how, whether it's the visuals or the music or anything like that, makes you feel as a person. And then also about the why. You know, if, if, you know, you're somebody who looks at this image and, you know, gets joy out of it and is like, yeah, absolutely. A, a we made it kind of feeling. It's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, also then think about why, like, you know, what things have you experienced or overcame or gone through in your life where you can kind of get that sort of understanding from this image. And then on the other side. If you're, uh, you know, I, I'm also thinking about the viewer, the visualizer, especially as a black person, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's black music. And so, you know, at least, you know, myself as a black musician as well, too, my primary audience and the people I make my music for are also black. And if everybody else appreciates it, that's great, too. So mm -hmm. at the same time, thinking about, you know, hip hop and rap being black music and, you know, black people then seeing an image like this too you there's the positive aspect of it where it can feel you know celebratory and uh we made it and and a very you know justified sense of also killing off this systemic oppression so to speak like if we're able to celebrate like this on the white house lawn with a dead you know justice you know at the bottom of the image and it's like all right then we've clearly help to shake up a lot of the systemic issues that have been going on if this image is able to exist in its reality one day, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. if King Kendrick could be president one day, you know, if Kendrick's president is one day, I believe that this image could absolutely be on the White House lawn. Why not? It's mm -hmm. just a cookout. It's very cookout vibe, you know, except everybody got bread and some champagne. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, then, as a Black person who might look at this and go, oh, well, you know, it could be, you know, very nearish then it's like damn like you know you threw the hard er in that you know what's going on internally with you you know mm -hmm. what, what, but what mm -hmm. might you be seeing or what might you have been socialized to then see this image and only see negativity mm -hmm. you know you know or to only be like oh I, I see anger and i see violence and i see this it's like mm -hmm. how like why there's not a weapon in the image there's the justice yeah he's got x's in his eyes so presumably he's dead but we don't know how he died but well what's uh, interesting is is that the the person who is standing just just over him you know has that bottle in his hand not in the position where you'd be <laughs> drinking that bottle but but in but holding it in gripping it right in right, right as though it were a weapon you right, know? yeah because the fact that he's way. that's right and the other way. interesting thing is is that the way that the group is arranged you know if you look at mm -hmm. it in terms of perspective going back mm -hmm. you know they're not just just spread out but they're 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 within a certain kind of framework. Yeah. And, and one of the images that came to my mind, the fact that they are bare chested mm -hmm. reminds me a bit of a slave ship mm -hmm. and that they are, it's like a mutiny. Yeah. A takeover. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, Absolutely. So there's, 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 again, it, it's very provocative. It's got a lot of interesting components to it. 
And as you said, depending on where you're coming from, it can either play into a certain kind of stereotype or it could play into the idea of celebration and overcoming adversity mm-hmm. or both. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So yeah, so that that's definitely one album that I thought would be a good lead in for this conversation um, just because of, you know, its relevancy, but also at the same time, the fact that, you know, people who might be streaming it, again, might not have actually taken the time to find a larger image of this and like to actually zoom in and, and see what's going on and to get a better understanding or feel of it. It's just for a lot of folks might just be the album artwork and keeps it moving. Yeah. And I, I love, by the way, what Kendrick does with, you know, in terms of working with jazz musicians. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, that, that kind of breaking of boundaries, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that, that in and of itself is a way that, that breaks out of certain perceived ideas of what, you know, rap music can be or hip hop, you Mm -hmm. know, in general. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of that. Leave that on a high note. (laughs) (laughs) So another album that I thought was really cool. And I know you had also mentioned, you know, some of Earth, Wind & Fire's work, um, but that also gets me into painting. So, you know, we talked about Kendrick's album um, and that's a photograph and was definitely done through some Photoshop and some additional, you know, enhancements that made it to its final version. Uh, But there are also works that, our paintings. And I think that for the rest of the albums that we have to talk about in this conversation, all of them started off originally as a hand painted work. One of those being Michael Jackson's Dangerous album, which was completed in 1991 by Mark Ryden under the art direction of Nancy Donald. Wow. Yeah, it's an incredible album cover. Uh, and um, I know you have some things to say about it. Um, the first time I saw it, of course, was when when it came out in 91. Yep. And um, some aspects of the sound, I know Teddy Riley had a big role in this. Mm-hmm. Um, some aspects of it have a certain industrial sound. And you can, see the, so. you can see that in the center of the composition, when you look under the dangerous sign mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. you see all of this industry, when I say industry, I'm talking about like factories, like mm-hmm. they could be 19th century factories, uh, early 20th century factories. Yep. Uh, that, that is fascinating to me. So there's multiple layers of depth in this composition. You want to say some other things about this as well, I'm sure. The biggest thing about it, I think, is just the amount of depth that's in it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the amount of symbolism and and so many different things that I didn't even notice until even just pulling it up for this conversation. Like, wow, there are additional things that uh, I'd come across. Like, I didn't realize that there was, you know, an homage to Captain EO, his movie that he made uh, at Walt Disney World. And Mm -hmm. we saw, you know, whenever we went down to Disney back when I was like six years old, the Captain EO movie and we went back and watched it like two, three times because I wanted to see it again and again and again. It was like 4D and um, you had the 3D glasses, but it would also like have like different sensory things to make it that fourth dimension. It was yes. such a cool experience. <laughs> yeah, that was quite quite a, a, a film. I mean, it was a, it was a standalone. I, I don't think there's any I've seen anything since quite like it. Mm hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there were there were humorous parts, and you know, we can look back on it and you know make certain comments about um, <laughs> certain production aspects of it, you know, right, right. in light of what's transpired today. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, given that time, the idea of pushing forward and using technology in an innovative way to reach an audience, uh, Michael was always on the cutting edge of that. Even even up to the time of his death, he was still looking for ways to push the boundaries of what should happen. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And like that whole entertainment and circus aspect of it also is reflected in the album artwork as well, uh, because you have P.T. Barnum at the very bottom Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the image, uh, which was, and mysteriously he has the, a pin that says 1998 on it. And um, there's no, understanding as to what that stands for um, but there's various symbols in numerology numerology and numerological symbols in the album artwork as well uh, mm. because you know the little uh circus ringleader that's sitting on top of 
P.T. Barnum's head or standing, I should say, uh, has the number seven on it. The elephant up at the top above the dangerous sign has the number nine branded on its head uh, and one of its tusks are broken. Um, so it's just a lot of like unknown or in, in able to be interpreted symbolism throughout the entire piece that uh, just really, you know, we talk about layers and depth just goes on and on throughout this project. Um, you know, all the cherubs that are throughout it, you know, each playing different instruments and sitting in different positions. Uh, you know, there's the dog king on the left side and the hummingbird queen on the right side that also take a lot of inspiration from artwork uh, that goes back, you know, several centuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Napoleon on his throne. I know you know a lot about, you know, a lot of this, you know, historical <laughs> art perspective. Um yeah. But yeah, so you, you know, you get that, uh, you know, kind of remade into this artwork. Mm-hmm. The uh, foot of that dog was also inspired by another artist by by another work from that artist. Was it Ingre? Ang. Angre. Angre. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and um, could you tell us more about the original artist that this was inspired well, from? Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned, this was a French artist, uh, Angre. Mm-hmm. And he uh, was within the court of the French, the, the French monarchy at the time. So all of the images, like the original Napoleon I on his imperial throne, is meant to show just that, Napoleon as an emperor, a king, a, a god on mm-hmm. earth, uh, which goes back even further in certainly French um, history. Mm-hmm. Uh, this idea of the, like the sun king, for example, you know, Louis mm-hmm. XIV. So he worked in a very, very fastidious style. In other words, where every detail, and not only are you showing the, the majesty and the authority and the omniscience and omnipresence of this uh, ruler, but also the way that he holds staffs and scepters that suggest his authority and control. Mm. Uh, and by showing it with a great deal of detail and specificity, goes within the whole idea of how you can look at someone and see everything has meaning, everything has purpose, everything has significance. There is nothing that is left to the imagination. Everything that you need to know essentially is right there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so when we think about somebody like a Michael Jackson, this is somebody who also had omnipresence that was everywhere. Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, which could be a blessing, but for Michael Jackson, it could also be a curse. Because on one hand, he was the B.T. Barnum who was creating this circus. But at the same time, he could be perceived as also the victim of it, something that he was trying to get away from. So it was like a double-edged sword. So I think that there are a lot of different uh, aspects to the selection of the artist that uh, or the subject matter within the painting itself that speaks to different aspects of, of Michael the person, mm-hmm. uh, how he saw himself, mm-hmm. whether he saw himself as the victor or whether he also at the same time saw himself really as a parody of himself or how yeah, he yeah. perceived himself to be. Any of these individuals here, the way they're parodied in this particular painting Mm-hmm. Michael saw that he himself was also parodied, you know, in the press. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which definitely gets to another inspiration for this painting uh, by Mark Ryden, Michael's music video, Leave Me Alone. Uh, but I'd also mentioned before we get to that uh, about uh, the other uh, royal figure in the image. Um, I had mistakenly said it was a hummingbird because I always thought it was that, you know, as a kid. But it's actually a kingfisher bird that's a combination of two d- different portraits of Queen Elizabeth the first, as well as Queen Elizabeth the second. Um, and mm. thinking about the Queen Elizabeth in Michael's life, who would be Elizabeth Taylor, how that could also be some sort of homage to her to some extent as well. Yes. Um, but you talk That's about the press and, and, and everything. She's also included in his music video for Leave Me Alone, whenever they had the shrine to Elizabeth Taylor as he's going through it on the yes. um, rocket ship, because that was something in this tabloid saying that Michael had a shrine to Elizabeth Taylor. So he goes through all the tabloid stuff through that video too. Um, so it's really interesting how that music video also helped to serve as an inspiration for the Dangerous album cover as well. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I think that the particular scene in the video came from a film called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, where she's walking like through that living room, that that space. I forget. Where oh, yeah, yeah. That one something. part in the in the music video when, yeah, when Michael's going through the cave and then you see Elizabeth walk across the screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Another aspect of the Dangerous album cover that also resembles the Leave Me Alone video is the inclusion of Bubbles, his pet chimp throughout so much of this. You know, he's at the top with the crown uh, getting put on his head at the very top of the album artwork, but he's also at the bottom left in the carriage that's kind of going through the portal that also resembles a lot of carnival-esque or, um, you know, festival-like carriages, carriage rides that take you in and through different scenes. And on the outside, you know, the other side, I should say, you see a young Michael and a young Macaulay Culkin with the M on his shirt. But yeah, so that also just reminds me a little bit of the Leave Me Alone music video as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting to note that Ang was considered, just to kind of go back to the style of painting, uh, Mm -hmm. that he was uh, considered what's called a neoclassical painter. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he was basically trying to establish himself as the artistic style of the court, Mm. right? And, And to sort of reinforce a certain kind of uh, some might say a certain kind of rigid approach to painting, which was going against what was uh, what was considered the Romantic style of painting in France at that time. So a kind of orthodoxy, you know, he mm-hmm. was trying to set up. What's mm-hmm. interesting is that Michael is is taking that and sort of standing it on its head. You know, mm-hmm. this idea of this, you know, a certain kind of rigid or orthodoxy style or approach and making actually critiques about the very structure in terms of society and, and so forth that, um, that is anything but orthodox. In fact, what he's creating is something that seems to be the antithesis of that. And so that's, that's one of the observations that I've made in terms of the album uh, cover. It's yeah, using sure. a style, you know, to make another kind of statement, you mm-hmm. know, Another person who makes a statement through their work using a more neoclassical approach would be someone like Kahindi Wiley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. And if anybody doesn't know who that is, uh, he's did the famous portrait of Barack Obama in front of all of the leaves and flowers. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Kahindi Wiley's work definitely would fall in that vein. So he's taking a certain European traditional or neoclassical approach and uh, using subject matter that is uh, goes against that particular tradition itself. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so the idea of agency, when you when you say uh, going back to Kendrick Lamar, mm-hmm. you know this idea of taking over, the idea of taking traditional portraiture and investing it with content subject matter that goes against the way it traditionally would have been used as portrait photography, I think is another kind of, I hesitated to say subversion, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but in a sense, that's, that's what it is. It is subverting uh, a certain kind of traditional narrative that would be associated with this particular uh, genre of painting. Uh, In other words, the portrait uh, Mm -hmm. painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's other works of art that are also done throughout this is, you know, Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights is reflected throughout Michael's Dangerous album cover. Um, you know, the globe that's in the center flipped upside down um, is mm-hmm. also inspired from that same work as well. Some of the animals and the two-legged creatures that are hidden within it, the various skulls that are throughout it. It's, it's, it's really incredible how much is packed into this work of art. Absolutely. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's a very, very uh, evocative uh, work and um, one that people will probably continue to talk about for generations to come. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that this work also connects to an album that you had mentioned earlier, considering you know there are two regal figures on this, because there's also very regal figures in Earth, Wind & Fire's All in All. Um, Mm -hmm. And that work you had brought up before, um, and I know that you you have a deep appreciation for the artists of this work as well, um, and the work that they also did in several other Earth, Wind & Fire albums. 
Yeah, Shusei Nakaoka is a Japanese or was a Japanese artist that you know I became aware of first through the Earth, Wind, and Fire albums. I think first through the album uh, All in All, uh, mm -hmm. which was an incredible work that involved Tom Tom '84. In fact, you can hear Tom Tom's name being mentioned on one of the tracks called Running. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. One of the things that I really liked about Shusei's work on here is the way that he has this concept of ancient to the future. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, it embodies a certain sense of Afrofuturism. Right, even though he's Japanese. Even though he's Japanese. When he would communicate with Maurice White, Maurice uh, sent him uh, some sketches, some drawings that he did, that Maurice did, of a kalimba, of uh, images. He wanted to have, make sure that there were images of Shakespeare. He wanted there to be all kinds of references to uh, some of the symbolism that's on the album cover. If you could see, or not just on the album cover, but within the album cover in the gatefold, uh, so, for example, if you go inside the album, you can see references to different religious traditions, uh, as well as I mentioned before, Shakespeare, the crucifix. You can see a reference to the caduceus that is associated with the sign of medicine, but also has roots in Asclepius, or also known as Imhotep, mm -hmm. the father of medicine, of healing. And uh, then you also see the symbol of Jupiter which is the name of one of those songs on the album. Right. You see where it says it looks like a 24? Yep. Or yep. a four? Yeah. Contracted there. And Imhotep was also the first to design and build a pyramid. That's correct. He was also an architect. That's right. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this, when you look at inside here and you see this book opened up mm -hmm. and you see this flame, you know, it, it speaks to you of not only of things related to music, things related to religion, things related to language and storytelling. And you have the eye of providence in the background there looking out from the pyramids. You see mm -hmm. cherubim in the sky mm -hmm. as lightning flashes through the storms of clouds. And you can see it lands behind the head of Khafre, one of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And it's his head that's carved on the Sphinx. It's believed to be his head, yes, yes. Now, this was just one album. That if, you, if you flip the album on the other side, on the opposite side of the gatefold, that's where you see symbols of modernity or the future, spaceships, all kinds of uh, technology you know, that speaks to an age going forward. This is something that could have been lifted from you know, Black Panther, Right, right. Yeah, it looked like straight yeah. out of Wakanda. Yeah. And so you say, well, what it, it, it boggles the mind. Then you start thinking, wow, you know, there is a connection between the ancient past. There is much that we can learn. There is much that can be built upon the lessons and, and the sciences, the exploration, the wisdom of the past. It's not to say that everything can be lifted because there are some things that obviously have not played out over time in a way that is sustainable because yeah, that's, yeah. that's the process of discovery. New doors open, new possibilities, new avenues to explore, uh, which make certain things that you had believed or considered before to be effective. Perhaps there's a better way. Perhaps there's a more enlightened way. But the important thing is, is that to understand the past, uh, to take the best lessons from that past and apply it in a way here and now, that works, that makes sense, and that can be the foundation for, and will be in some way the foundation for the future. To do it in a mindful way and in a responsible way, I think is one of the things that I got from looking at this album cover, that we can learn from the past, that we can take the best, that Sankofa concept, you know, yeah. of yeah. taking the lessons from the past and carrying it forward into the future. And I think that that is a kind of uplifting attitude that that helped sustain many people who were fans of Earth, Wind, and Fire. People might have been facing adverse circumstances. The only options they had were those that were presented to them 
in their neighborhood, which may not have been something that is necessarily affirming of their deeper values as human beings or their aspirations. There may have been some certain adverse circumstances that went against their very nature, you know, their willingness to, as they say, do the right thing. So Earth, Wind & Fire through the album covers opens up, I think, these kind of possibilities or pathways psychologically that you're not limited there. And I think that music has, has played this role, whether you're talking about Parliament Funkadelic, mm-hmm. you know, songs like Flashlight. Yeah. And all their album covers are, were crazy. Every, they were real and, cool. Yeah. But listen to songs like, you know, everybody's got a little light under the sun. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. it's like this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. I mean, this this message has come through through generations in various ways. Yeah, and yeah. so by having album art, that can also speak to that kind of aspiration. When we go back and look at the work of Maddie Clarwine on Earth, Wind and Fire's The Last Days and Time, mm-hmm. that's another way of talking about how, if you, if you look on the album cover, you see there's a woman and you see that there is uh, energy either being generated from her or reaching her but she's somehow connected to this sort of cornucopia of earth energy of life. And it's also yeah. rising from the mind of Maurice White, mm-hmm. who stands just behind her. And if you look at the lines that define the crosswalk of the street behind them, you notice that it forms a pyramid. Wow. Yeah. And so that idea, Egyptology, was very important to Maurice White. So he communicated this, presumably, to Maddie Clarwine. And that's what you have here. Again, possibilities, growth, enlightenment, fecundity. That is what this album cover. But it's the end of one particular chapter, you know, and the opening up of a new chapter, a new possibility, new worlds. And this was, by the way, the first... Earth, Wind, and Fire album that came out that had the traditional lineup of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, wow! So it was also is, the end of uh, of one era and the of beginning Earth, of Wind, the Fire era and that we correct, know. <laughs> correct. That's correct. That's when the the younger guys like Philip Bailey and and others joined the band. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. The only holdovers from the previous incarnation of Earth, Wind, and Fire were Verdine and Maurice. Wow! Yeah, yeah, and it's really cool how you, you see like. Uh, meteors coming through and presumably about to strike the earth on one side. And then the other side, there's rainbows. Uh, you'd mentioned the energy that's, you know, either striking down or coming through or coming from the woman uh, also looks like electricity that also touches and connects to every other figure that's in the image as well. It's really cool and really well done as, you know, water droplets and, and storm clouds and fire. It's, it's as though there's, there's earth, there's wind, there's fire, <laughs> there's rain. There's all of this stuff uh, within this album cover. Um, yeah. As well as uh, uh, what seems to be some sort of church on the right hand side. It looks, you know, very Southern, almost like, you know, like yes. you out of like Texas or like the Alamo or something, but you know, yeah, it, it has all of this symbolic meaning. On the left side, there's palm trees. You know, it's it's really, really, really stands out. Um, you said that was Maddie Clarwine. That, yeah, that same person who did uh, the album, some albums from Miles Davis, uh, for example, Live Evil, mm-hmm. and um, the one we mentioned, of course, Bitches Brew. Mm-hmm. And, of course, before that, Santana's uh, on his Abraxas album, uh, it yeah. was actually a painting called The Annunciation, which was done in 1961. Hmm. And uh, Carlos apparently had seen it, was was excited about it, and decided to you know, use that for the cover of his Abraxas album. Wow. Yeah, Matty wow. Clarwine, again, uh, is interesting because he knew people like Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, he knew, as well as Miles and others. So uh, he had a, a great way of fusing different types of imagery together. For example, if you look on the Bitches Brew album, you know, you can see this joining of black and white. You can see that he has another painting called Sun and Moon, which also has this sort of combination of black and white. Matty Clarwine was born in Palestine, and then he lived in other places around the world. He lived in Africa. He lived in, I believe, in South America, the United States. And so you can see examples of this fusion of different cultures, different interests, 
reflected in his work. Mm -hmm. And there are some examples of his work that has really a strong influence of the surrealists, you know, the people like Salvador Dali and others. Yeah. Um, and his initial teacher, though, was someone by the name of Ernst Fuchs, who was a kind of fantasy-like artist. And um, you see that reflected in his works, F-U-C-H-S. It's really cool learning about Matty Clarwine and a lot of the work that he's done. I mean, you know, some of the Jimi Hendrix work and, you know, everything with Santana's Abraxas and all. And, and they all seem to have somewhat similar yet different styles. And the, the paintings have a similar style, but, you know, Abraxas also seems to have a, like a sort of collage kind of feel to it, um, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to Matty Clarwine's paintings, it does remind me a little bit of some of the uh, surrealism that we kind of get from another artist who's done a lot of work with a lot of different albums and you know commercials, Sam Spratt. Mm. And Sam Spratt is a, a visual artist who his album artwork is paintings that end up becoming prints and, and digitized and into album artworks. He's done a lot of work with Logic. Uh, he's done all of the artwork for all of Logic's albums, um, including mm. probably his most recognizable one, which is the artwork for his album, Everybody, that has over 90 figures in it, myself included. And, and there's, there's something else about that particular painting, art historically. Right. Do you know what that is? Well, that it comes from the wedding at Cana is what it's originally based on. So the artwork that Sam was inspired by for Logic's Everybody was actually based off of the wedding feast at Cana uh, by Paolo Veronese. Um, and so when Logic was at the Louvre and he was looking for the Mona Lisa, he saw this huge crowd of people all, you know, trying to huddle and get their photos and pictures of the Mona Lisa. And then he turns around and sees this massive image that nobody's really looking at at all. And he's like, you know, everybody's, everybody's, you know, fighting over one another to look at this really small picture. Yet, if you mm. turn around, there's this incredible work of art that is just right behind you. And so he decided to take a picture of that work of art, which was the mm -hmm. wedding feast at Cana. And he was so inspired by it that he reached out to Sam and was like, I'd like you to recreate this, except with all of the people that are on the album and my friends, et cetera, et cetera. And that became the work uh, for the album, Everybody. Wow. Wow. I didn't but, know that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, but he's also done other works, you know, the, and, and similar ones like the Clio Awards has, you know, a very similar feel to it with a lot of different figures. But I think more recently, uh, a work of art that also has that surrealist kind of vibe is the artwork for Kid Cudi's Man on the Moon 3. Um, mm. is the purple and reddish figure of Kid Cudi, but at the same time, it kind of splits his face in half, almost like Two-Face from Batman. And the other half of it is uh, sort of like the anatomy of a human or the anatomy of Kid Cudi as it also dissipates into the space or ether or you know the unknown universe, so to speak. And I just thought it was such a really cool album cover and work of art. Um, and again, also done by Sam Spratt, that was once again originally a painting. So whenever you bring up Maddie Clarwine and some of the work that Maddie has done, especially with albums like Bitches Brew, that really reminds me of the work that Sam has done with Man on the Moon 3. Mm. Mm. Wow. And also makes me think, actually, back to the Michael Jackson Dangerous, there's also a little boy whose face is split right down the middle on the Dangerous album artwork where one half of his uh, skin is black and, you know, he's, he's African-American. The other half is white or, you know, Caucasian, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so there's, you know, the splitting of an image or of a body or face is actually something that kind of comes up throughout several of the works of art that we've talked about. That's a good point. While you're saying that, I, I was also thinking of so something else and was going back to the Power Light album. Yeah. Yeah. With the figure of, um, was that uh, not not Vitruvian Man? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it also has the chakras, right? It has the chakras. Yes. And that and was also done by the same artist as the previous work, right? Shusei Nagaoka. Yes. Yeah. 
and the and the Vitruvian Man, which was originally done by Leonardo da Vinci, the last part of I think it was about fourteen ninety or so. It's based on notes that he made on a Roman architect by the name of Vitruvius, mm. and um, it's showing these proportions. You know where a human being is standing, basically like in two positions. You know? So the mm-hmm. arms are outstretched and then the arms are down, but it's all inside of a circle and a square. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's representing certain types of ideal, what are considered ideal proportions, which I think it goes back to this idea that the measure of all things can be found in the human body, you wow. know, the human being. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, in a way, it kind of relates to this idea that we are, you know, part of, we're, we're a microcosm of the macrocosm, and mm-hmm. the macrocosm is connected to us. Um, and also physically with the bodies you're talking about proportionally and you know, everything like that, but then also with the artwork of Power Light, there's the spiritual or the, the internal as well with the chakras represented too. Right, and, and also with the root chakra, being associated with the kundalini mm-hmm. and and how uh one of the songs that maurice white had come up with in his all in all album is a song called serpentine fire which relates That's to great. the the kundalini concept you know the serpent you know the coiling and so forth mm-hmm. so he definitely made sure that that the philosophies the things that he had studied different wisdom traditions and so forth you know, manifested itself in his work. He considered Earth, Wind, and Fire to be essentially a jazz band, you know, doing pop R&B type music. Right. Uh, but at the same time, it was also a vessel through which he could infuse his own sensibility, not just in terms of the selection of songs or the juxtaposition of certain types of songs, but also by creating these fusions through the use of interludes Mm-hmm. Uh, like a suite would connect these different disparate elements together into one, just as the way that as a, a citizen of the world, we are part and parcel of a whole. Absolutely. Well, that's a great way to end it. I mean, <laughs> I really enjoyed um, this conversation with you. Oh, I always enjoy talking with you, Papo. And I know there's a lot more we we could talk about. And I literally mean that because I'm thinking about the different ways that musicians have spoken about art, mm-hmm. right? you know, whether it's Bill Evans on the back of the Miles Davis kind of blue album, talking about the relationship between improvisation and Japanese Zen Buddhist painting. Mm-hmm. The fact that Miles Davis also painted the fact that yeah. Charlie Parker painted, studied with a guy named Harvey Cropper. Yeah, let's do that for an episode. Okay, all right. Where, where we talk about just, you know, musicians that also are visual artists themselves. Okay, all right. That's a That'd good idea. Cool. Yeah. Yeah.